The longest reigning monarch in British history, Queen Elizabeth II, has died. We look at her relations with the Catholic Church as the British Commonwealth mourns the loss of its sovereign. A lot of these are Missouri women, and now we even see that others are coming from other states, uh, from Texas to Kentucky to Tennessee. Life after Roe, one America but 50 states. We go to the middle of the country to show how different abortion laws are in neighboring states. I want to focus on what's, what's most important here, and that's the life of the mother and the life of the baby. Breaking down the political, pastoral, and societal fallout from the Dobbs decision, an expert panel provides insight and context on abortion laws and the pro-life movement in the U.S. Taking into account the situation that is happening now around the world, especially keeping in mind the war in Ukraine, we see that we have a special obligation to pray for peace in Ukraine and around the world. A glimpse of the small community of Catholics in Kazakhstan, where leaders of the world's faiths, including Pope Francis, will be gathering for interreligious dialogue. EWTN News In Depth starts now. Britain is the great country it is today because of her. Through thick and thin, Queen Elizabeth II provided us with the stability and the strength that we needed. She was the very spirit of Great Britain. The end of a royal era for Great Britain and the world. The longest reigning monarch in British history, Queen Elizabeth II, has died. The crown now passes to her son, King Charles III. Her death comes seven months after she marked the 70th anniversary of her accession to the throne during Platinum Jubilee celebrations. A remarkable achievement for a woman who was thrust into the spotlight at a young age after the death of her father. Throughout her reign, she witnessed unprecedented political, social and cultural changes in the United Kingdom and the broader Commonwealth. She also weathered scandals within the royal family and parliament. Queen Elizabeth passed away at the age of 96 Thursday at Balmoral Castle in Scotland. Welcome to EWTN News In Depth. Crowds have steadily gathered outside of Buckingham Palace, other royal residences and British embassies around the world after the announcement of the Queen's death to place flowers and cards. Commentary on her legacy has one recurring theme, her dedication to duty. During the course of Queen Elizabeth's reign, she served alongside 15 prime ministers, from Winston Churchill to Liz Truss, who the Queen met with just days ago as part of her official duties. She embarked on numerous official trips, visiting more than 100 countries, meeting with presidents, prime ministers and tribal leaders, and of course, popes. As head of the Church of England, Queen Elizabeth's meetings with Catholic popes provided a path for unity between faiths that split back in the reign of King Henry, King Henry VIII close to 500 years ago. EWTN Rome correspondent Colin Flynn tells us about her interactions with the Vatican over the years. In 1951, then Princess Elizabeth stepped foot in the Vatican for the very first time when she met Pope Pius XII. She was only 24 years old. The following year, she was crowned Queen Elizabeth II and would return to the Vatican with Prince Philip by her side in 1961, her visit making history. An historic occasion for his nearly 40 years since a British sovereign had an audience with a Pope. In 1980, under the stunning artwork in the Apostolic Palace, Queen Elizabeth would meet Pope John Paul II for the first time. The two had a warm friendship and would go on to meet on two other occasions, again in 1982 when Pope John Paul II became the first Pope to set foot in Britain and was welcomed by the Queen at Buckingham Palace. And 20 years later, when in 2000, the Queen travelled to the Vatican for her final private meeting with the Polish Pope. In 2010, Queen Elizabeth met with Pope Benedict XVI in Scotland during his four-day visit to the United Kingdom. After the meeting, the Pope said they both shared concerns for the well-being of people in the world and the important role 
of Christian values in society. In 2014, England's longest serving monarch would return to the Vatican for a final time at the age of 88, 63 years after her first visit as a princess. She met with Pope Francis and the two exchanged warm words and gifts. Upon departing, the Pope told the Queen to pray for him and not to forget, to which the Queen replied, don't worry, I won't. Yesterday, Pope Francis sent a telegram to King Charles III and the people of the United Kingdom, expressing his heartfelt condolences, complimenting a life dedicated to service, and said he would be praying for the Queen's eternal rest. At the Vatican in Rome, Colm Flynn, EWTN News in Depth. There's much more to know and celebrate about the long life of Queen Elizabeth, including her role as head of the Church of England. We'll reflect more on that next week when we look at what she meant as a moral and religious figure for her people, the Commonwealth, and the world. There are a lot of women who are still choosing in Missouri abortion, and they are going across the river to Illinois um, to procure those, um, or choosing chemical abortion, um, which unfortunately you can get get that through the mail. And now we turn to the next major topic of this edition of EWTN News In Depth. Life in America in a post-Roe world. One country, 50 states, each with its own laws on abortion. Since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, the abortion debate has skyrocketed to the top of the political agenda for many lawmakers and organizations supporting both sides. The Dobbs decision caused many trigger laws to take effect to ban abortion at various moments in a pregnancy. And many of those laws are already bogged down in multiple lawsuits. This map shows the state of abortion laws across the country. Abortion remains legal in the light blue states like California, New York, and all of New England. It's banned or severely restricted in the red states and remains in limbo in the yellow states. On Wednesday in Michigan, a judge ruled a pre row 1931 law banning abortion is unconstitutional. The country's watching to see if GOP lawmakers make an appeal, which pro-abortionists say is very likely. As a patchwork of laws take effect across the country, nowhere are disparities more evident than in neighboring states with opposing approaches to abortion. Reporter Mark Irons found a stark example of that on the shores of the Mississippi River. On one side, Missouri, where all abortions are banned except in the case of a medical emergency. On the other, Illinois, where abortion is legal all the way up to birth. The Gateway Arch in St. Louis, Missouri tops the skyline an iconic symbol in the American Midwest. On the western bank of the Mississippi River, it towers above the highways that bridge Missouri to Illinois, and it serves as a landmark dividing line in the ongoing battle over abortion. The St. Louis Arch stands behind me in Missouri, where some of the most pro-life laws in the country exist, but right across the Mississippi River, here in neighboring Illinois, it's a completely different story. <laughs> With the Supreme Court dismantling Roe versus Wade this summer, the focus has shifted from the federal to state level to sort out the future of abortion in America. Missouri and Illinois with a clear divide in their approach, side by side geographically, but worlds apart legally. Missouri law says the life of each human being begins at conception. Illinois says a fetus does not have independent rights under the laws of this state. Following the Supreme Court's ruling in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, Missouri became the first state to effectively ban abortion, except in cases of medical emergency. But the victories for unborn life here weren't secured with one historic court decision. This has been an ongoing fight, you know, year after year, decade after decade, quite honestly. Jamie Morris, the executive director of the Missouri Catholic Conference, says over the years, pro-life advocates have been very successful in taking an incremental approach toward restricting abortion, like mandating a 72-hour waiting period before the procedure, regulating abortion clinics, and passing a law that requires minors to notify parents before an abortion. Abortion provider Planned Parenthood has only one location in the state, and Missouri laws protect life, but the reasons women seek abortion haven't gone away. We could run Planned Parenthood out of the state, but that by itself doesn't, it doesn't eliminate, 
you know, tough situations, um, unplanned pregnancies, and un unexpected family issues. And if Missouri women want an abortion, they can simply travel to Illinois. Pro-life groups tell us thousands of them do and have been for years. And even more have arrived since the Supreme Court reversed Roe. We saw an influx of people coming from out of state. Here in Granite City, Illinois, just 10 miles from the Arch in St. Louis, Jerry Cap and other volunteer sidewalk advocates try to change the hearts and minds of women about to step inside this abortion clinic by providing them with information about safe housing, financial assistance, and adoption, resources that could help them choose to give birth. Our ministry doesn't change. It doesn't matter what state they came from and how many people, we're still going to reach out to them. But pro-life groups say what does need to change. The need is to change the law. And by doing that, people need to stay in tune with what are the laws in Illinois. Mary Fleming, director of the Respect Life Apostolate in the Diocese of Belleville, Illinois, describes some of the most aggressive laws in the country opposing unborn life. Abortion is legal up until birth in the state of Illinois. There's no parental notification at all. So anyone as young as 10 who's pregnant can get an abortion without their parents being notified. If Illinois is to become more pro-life, advocates and lawmakers will undoubtedly need to support the same incremental approach that slowly changed Missouri in the decades leading up to the Supreme Court's decision this past summer. Brian Westbrook, the executive director of Coalition Life, looks back at the impact. It was a multifaceted uh, effort to bring Missouri from uh, 20,000 abortions in 1984 down to only 152 uh, right before the Dobbs decision. Westbrook began his work in St. Louis, Missouri, but has since moved across the border to Fairview Heights, Illinois. Here, he oversees a paid staff of pro-life sidewalk counselors. They stay posted outside this Planned Parenthood during every hour it's open. This facility opened in 2019 as abortion became even more restricted in Missouri. Coalition Life soon opened up right next door. Westbrook believes about 6,000 abortions take place at this Planned Parenthood annually. A lot of these are Missouri women, and now we even see that others are coming from other states, uh, from Texas to Kentucky to Tennessee. Travel for abortion will continue in this post-Roe America as different state laws emerge. And women may choose to abort when they feel it's their only option. To choose between a roof over their head um, or aborting their child. Peggy Forrest is the CEO of Our Ladies in Maternity Home, providing rooms, meals, care, and support for women so they can choose life for their child. Forrest runs the home in Missouri on the outskirts of St. Louis. But in this area, she knows all too well laws alone aren't a roadblock to abortion. Not only do we want abortion to be illegal, we want it to be unthinkable. Um, we never want a woman to have to choose abortion because of her financial circumstances or pressure from others. Um, so it's really now um, a battle with people's hearts. Mark Irons, EWTN News in depth. While state legislators on both sides of the abortion issue continue to battle it out in states across the country, the pro-life movement continues its mission. One of the largest displays of the movement is the annual March for Life. Held on the anniversary of the Roe v. Wade decision in Washington, D.C. each year, it draws tens of thousands from across the country who take part. Some pray along the way. Others share their stories of life or regrets of abortion. And all stand as a symbol of the diversity of the movement. It spans ages, races, religions, and economic class. The president of the March for Life, Jeannie Mancini, joins us now to talk about the future of the pro-life movement and the March for Life. Jeannie, thank you so much for joining us. The latest Marist poll shows that 56% of Americans oppose the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. 40% support the Supreme Court decision. When we look at the percentages of those who support abortion rights, 55% support and 36% oppose, with an 8% saying they're unsure. What do these numbers mean to the pro-life movement? Are they accurately reflecting America? Well, Monsi, thanks for having me on. It's always such a joy to come on with you. So what I would say is that these up and down polls asking about if you agree with Roe, do you agree with the overturn of Roe, et cetera, are so misleading because sadly, the American public at large doesn't really know what Roe allowed, which is abortion until birth and, and essentially not allowing states to have limits after a certain point in time. So of course, the, the decision that went before the Supreme Court would have allowed states to limit abortion at and after 15 weeks. And under Roe, that wasn't allowed. So if you ask the average American where they stand on states allowing um, limitations, pro-life 
protections being enacted, they would strongly agree with that. And they do strongly agree with that. But when you ask them sort of up and down about Roe, they they really want Roe still on the books. And so the other piece to this, Monse, is that anytime there's been a big cultural change for a few months or even, you know, a year or so, we're going to see overreactions to that when people are, are polled. So I think that it's not really something to lean into in terms of trusting right now. I think we have to we do have our work cut out for us in terms of how we can gain back the narrative on this. And to me, I think the single most important thing that pro-lifers can be doing and pro-life leaders in the media can be doing is emphasizing two things, the humanity of the unborn child and how being pro-life is compassionate, how we seek to serve women, how abortion does a disservice to women and how we want to support women with real options when she's facing an unexpected pregnancy. So it's really about continuing to have the conversation and really figuring out the literacy around both the old decision, Roe, right, and the new decision, Dobbs. So I think that's an ongoing conversation that you and your team will probably be having. But the pro-life movement did take a big hit in Kansas when the defense of life was voted down. Why do you think that Absolutely. failed? So, gosh, there was so much happening there, Monsi. Again, I'd go back to this idea that it was so shortly after Dobbs came down and there's been just this misinformation campaign. And I would say that uh, that the, the other side, pro-abortion advocates, have definitely been portrayed in media um, on, in a way that pro-lifers have not. So, in other words, they've absolutely gained the narrative and most secular media is not giving the time of day to our side on this. So, for example, there's been so much misinformation about ectopic pregnancies and miscarriages, um, totally erroneous stuff. But despite us fighting, you know, the battle and showing the truth about that, it hasn't been popularly reported in mainstream press. But as for Kansas, so I would say, in addition to the timing of it, there it was a very hard message to sell because it was like a negative thing, so to mm -hmm. speak. So really, all that we were being, all that we were asking voters to do was allow Kansas to enact pro-life limitations. But the other side outspent and outmessaged this, and again, just wasn't. They were erroneous in their messaging. They made it sound that there would be a ban on all abortions in Kansas, um, that this would be, you know, totally different than what it was, which was allowing the state to enact limitations. So they also, again, just with the unfair sort of media coverage, I know um, I have a nephew who's in, in this work and he tried to get so many media interviews in Kansas and even little radio interviews, et cetera, and they wouldn't allow the pro-life side to be shown. So outspending, timing, hard to message, all of these things, I think, added up to a very sad defeat in Kansas. But we can't, you know, we can't be dismayed on this. We just have to keep on keep on striving here. And you're talking about your nephew. Many people think that the pro-life generation is made up of all Christian conservatives, old Christian conservatives. But there's a growing number of secular voices, including from the LGBTQ community, in support of life. Can you provide more context on the diversity of the pro-life movement? Oh, yeah. Anyone who's come to the March for Life knows how diverse we are, you know, ethnically, uh, people of different religious beliefs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I can just speak to the March for Life that, and, and invite all of your participants to come or just to check out, you know, photos of the march. But listen, the thing that joins us is knowing that abortion is the human rights abuse of today and knowing that the unborn child has inherent human dignity. And it's, listen, we're all kinds of people with different back down, backgrounds and belief systems, et cetera. And so at the March for Life, we're um, nonpartisan, we're nonsectarian. Uh, the only groups that we do not allow are groups that advocate for violence. Mm. I mean, we're just an anti-violent pro-life protest. So, um, so yeah, it's a beautiful, colorful uh, movement. Very different. So where are you going to end up now? Not at the Supreme Court anymore, but at the Capitol? Is the March for Life <laughs> going to change in some way? Well, you know, anybody who's marched that route knows that the Supreme Court is right across the street from the Capitol. So we probably will have the same landing spot, but we'll, we will be more focused on the legislative side versus the judicial side where we're landing. But gosh, what an exciting march this will be. So January 20th, 2023, you're all invited. I've been shocked how many people have asked if we'll continue to march. There is such a need to continue to march. 
this will be the 50th anniversary of the March for Life, the first post row march. But we've got so many battles still legislatively at the federal level, even simple things like keeping Hyde Amendment in appropriations every single year, which is arguably the most impactful pro-life policy. But of course, Monsi, I've shared with you and your, your viewers about our state march program, which is rapidly growing. Um, this year, we're in five states. Next year, we'll be in 10. We plan to double each year to, till we're in all 50 states. So, um, so much to celebrate and so much work to be done in this new season of building a culture of life. So lots of work to be done at the state level and also looking forward toward what will happen in the legislature for Protections for Life. Jeannie, I'm so grateful that you were here with us. Thanks for having me, Monse. Absolutely. Coming up on EWTN News In Depth, our discussion on the impact of the historic overturning of Roe v. Wade continues with a dive into the political, societal, and pastoral challenges we face. It's a really scary thing to go through as a woman, and they're lying to them and manipulating them and causing them to think they won't get basic health care. The fallout from the Supreme Court's decision in the Dobbs case. Three leading pro-life voices join me to discuss what's happening right now in America, next. Welcome back to EWTN News In Depth. Our discussion on abortion in the United States continues now with a look at the political, legal, and pastoral challenges for the pro-life movement as abortion legislation continues to evolve across the country. I recently had a conversation with leading pro-life voices to talk about this issue. We're joined by pro-life activist Christina Bennett, as well as Charles Camosi, a professor of medical humanities at Creighton University School of Medicine, and J.D. Long Garcia, the senior editor at America Media. J.D., there seems to be no grand strategy post Dobbs. The most recent ballot initiative in Kansas was a failure that took some by surprise. Was the pro-life community and the church ready for this? You know, it's, I think that we're in a moment right now where it might be premature to say that we're uh, post-Roe. Uh, the way things that have been playing out, I think that we're still figuring a lot of things out. There's been very a lot of emotional reaction to the Dobbs decision. So the, the pro-life movement, I think, has to set its bearings and, and, and maybe in some ways was surprised uh, by, by the reaction that's, that's, come, that's come about because of this. So uh, I think that right now there's a lot of things that are still up in the air and unclear what the future is going to look like. That lack of clarity brought out, as you mentioned, an emotional response to some of these lawsuits. Charlie, we're watching lawsuit after lawsuit come up through the state Supreme Courts, through district courts, either to block or defend pro-life laws. Will we just get stuck in the courts again? Uh, it might take a few years. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember Obamacare and its passage saw lawsuit after lawsuit after endless lawsuit. But here we are many, many years later, and it's the law of the land. Something similar, I think, is going to happen both at the state and perhaps the federal level. So let's get ready for a few lawsuits and to be in the courts for a while, but it won't last forever. And hopefully that'll give the opportunity for us to have this conversation. Christina, the American Association of Pro-Life OBGYNs released a myth versus facts sheet, correcting misinformation around care for women, telling Americans that no abortion restriction ends care for ectopic pregnancies or miscarriages. And one doctor gave expert testimony on the Hill. Let's take a listen. It is possible for our state to prevent abortions, which intentionally end the life of my fetal patients while still allowing for physicians to exercise their expert medical judgment in order to intervene in situations where the mother's life is in danger. Christina, why is this narrative around limiting care so dangerous? Well, it's dangerous because abortion advocates are lying to women and telling them that the treatment for an ectopic pregnancy, they'll not be able to receive that. I know how that feels. I myself went through a miscarriage, and I at one point feared that I had an ectopic pregnancy. I did not. But it's a really scary thing to go through as a woman, and they're lying to them and manipulating them and causing them to think they won't get basic health care, when in reality what we're doing is just banning abortion, which is the killing of innocent children in the womb. So that access to basic health care versus access to abortion, J.D., the Washington Post recently wrote that roughly 20.9 million women have lost access to nearly all elective abortions in their home states since Roe was overturned. And the Biden administration recently urged state and local leaders to protect access to abortion. How should the church respond to this? 
This that points really to a need for evangelization. I think. I think that you know, oftentimes in, on, in the political sphere, we talk about things in terms of getting votes or even winning, simply winning elections. But what we're talking about as Catholics is the people's souls, and and that isn't just a uh, something that happens instantly on one day where you check the box and then you become uh, one party or the other. What happens for us is much it's much more long term. It's much more about conversion, and we we need to begin to or to continue to lay the groundwork for for conversion. I think through having encounters with uh, with women that are, are in these situations, and then also. Being there for them and, and supportive and providing those wraparound services that will help women choose life. A church that really does walk with women and their children. Charlie, we've also seen the political space, as JD described, incite violence, where multiple life pregnancy centers have become the center of attacks because of misinformation or outright lies about the care these centers provide. Is this a new trend, one we should be concerned with? Well, we're certainly right to be concerned about it, but it isn't new. It's radically undercovered, of course, over the last several decades, where the narrative was, of course, that pro-lifers are the ones who are violent. Uh, but now it's undisputable. The uh, clear trend is one that um, our opponents on abortion are the ones who are violent. And the way to respond to this, of course, is the way Christ responded to violence, right? It's with nonviolence, it's with love, it's with care for the most vulnerable. It's these very brave and courageous centers, actually, who are getting out there and actually getting their hands dirty, smelling like the sheep, to support the most vulnerable children, uh, women, um, and their whole families. And I couldn't be prouder of those centers, actually, at this moment. That's beautiful. Christina, individual Supreme Court justices have also been targets of physical violence. And now the Supreme Court has become the political target from other branches of government, with senators and even the president making aggressive comments about specific members of the court post Dobbs. Is this also dangerous? Absolutely. Our Supreme Court justices should never have to live in fear that someone from the general public is going to attack them, rally outside their house, harass them when they go in public places to a restaurant or to be out with their family. And it is our job, especially the government's job, to make sure that they protect our justices so they feel safe. They can do their job knowing that they're protected and that they're safe. Charlie, we'll give you the last word before we take a break. Why do you think these issues, both violence against the Supreme Court and also violence with pregnancy centers, are undercovered? Unfortunately, I think in many contexts, the media narrative is not objectively journalistic, but one pushing a particular agenda, right? A, at least pro-choice, sometimes pro-abortion agenda. And unfortunately, as we see throughout our media culture today, both on the left and the right, narrative wins and journalism often fails. Uh, but we're grateful for setting the record straight here, that's for sure. Well, we'll definitely keep doing that. We'll be back to discuss criticisms of conservatives, post Dobbs, and other proposals to support life. Stay right there. Pro-life politicians on Capitol Hill are being called out for a lack of action in defending life as some corporations take major steps to fund abortions for their employees. Here's more of my conversation with an expert panel on the pro-life movement. We're joined once again by our expert panel, Christina Bennett, Charles Camosi, and J.D. Long Garcia, to dive back into our conversation on the post-row world. J.D., starting with you, it seems some think that this is a failure of policy and courage on the side of Republicans. Commentator Ben Shapiro recently noted that Republicans are losing steam because of Dobbs, citing the Democratic upswing in the wake of Dobbs. Is the pro-life community smaller than we think? Or is this a messaging issue around the life issue? Yeah, I think related to what Charlie said um, just previously, I think it has a lot to do with, with the media and how the media has covered this. Um, I, I don't think that there is a, uh, that, that we are underestimating or overestimating the size of the pro-life movement. I think it's very strong. Uh, I think at this point there, there's a lot of emotions in place and we've been bombarded uh, by uh, a media that's covering this as if it were uh, a, a great tragedy. And so I, I think that we have to keep that in mind. In terms of uh, Republicans losing steam, uh, you know, as a Catholic, I, I, I want to be on the side of life. And when I hear that certain parties are winning or losing, uh, I, I want to focus on what's, what's most important here, and that's the life of the mother and the life of the baby. 
And I think that the reason that Ben Shapiro points that out is because Republicans really have been running on the life platform for a long time. Christina, another comment this time by Ramesh Panuro at National Review, calling out Republicans avoiding the abortion issue who say it's a matter for the states to resolve. And he urges that they take up a 20-week federal ban proposal that many have supported in the past. Is this something that pro-lifers should do, incremental support of life? Well, we are in that place right now where we are in a battle for the states, and we can't deny that. I'm in the state of Connecticut, which is a very pro-abortion state. So while other states like Georgia and Florida and Alabama and Mississippi are making great progress, states like New York and Connecticut are not. But it is important for every person, Republican, Democrat, every person, to, to be involved and to, to not cast this issue aside, to make this a priority issue, and to fight for life and to fight to change their state. And it is something that happens incrementally. It does take time, but we can't lose steam. We have to keep on moving forward because lives are on the line. Charlie, what do you think about the 20-week proposal? I think a national conversation about this, frankly, is just too quick. Um, as has been mentioned a couple of times, it's a very emotional time. It's a very sort of ignorant time. People don't really know what they think about this. They have... Uh, Notre Dame, in fact, did a really important study if, a, a year or so ago showing most people don't really have coherent thoughts about abortion. They have, don't really think about it that much. But it is a golden opportunity for the church to be the church to kind of evangelize, right, exactly what's going on right now and saying, hey, here's how to think about prenatal justice. Here's to think about supporting women and families. And I think over, again, over two or three or four years, maybe we'd be ready for a more national conversation about that. Maybe a few more years of conversation. And one of the pieces of that conversation is fetal personhood. J.D., that's been in the news lately because the state of Georgia's Living Infants Fairness and Equality Act declares a fetus a person once a heartbeat is detected. And it offers child support for fetuses, a $3,000 tax exemption for mothers. Is this a way to start the conversation and a way forward? Uh, absolutely. I, I think it does. I, I think when it comes to personhood in general, there's a lot of mystery that's surrounding this. Uh, I, I think biologically, we know that from the moment of conception, uh, it is alive, This, this, uh, these cells, if you want to call them, they're alive and that they're distinctly human. Uh, the question of when personhood begins, I think it's one that, that can get very theological and very speculative. But uh, in that case, when we don't know, the answer is not that it's okay to terminate a pregnancy. The answer is when we don't know, it's like, well, if there, it very well could be a person. So I think that introducing this question into the debate is, very, is an important one, and it's an important step. Forcing people to recognize personhood and allowing the church, as Charlie said, to evangelize on the issue where we do believe there, there is life in the womb beginning at conception. Charlie, the National Abortion Federation then provides funding for travel and abortion pills. And it requires women now to take both abortion pills in the state where the abortion is legal. And this obviously requires more money. What's your reaction to this? Well, this is another place I think we as a pro-life movement can get better at. We, I don't think we're totally prepared, actually, for kind of interstate travel or abortion pills being sent through the mail or things like this. Um, we've, and I think it's fair to say we've been caught a little bit flat-footed on these issues. So, again, I think this is why it might take two, three, four years to really get this in order and kind of get our feet under us. But I think at a very basic level, there's an issue of justice no matter what state you're in. And do you think that companies are getting too involved? Yes, it's so interesting, in fact, to see corporations kind of cheerlead for abortion. I think that kind of uh, points to a, a political shift in the culture where people on the so-called right used to be maybe pro-corporation or pro-business are kind of taking a second look and saying, wait a minute, why are these corporations going all in for abortion? Why, in fact, are they paying for their employees to go elsewhere to get abortions instead of providing you know, uh, equal pay for equal work or paid family leave or, or other um, other things that support women and families, you know, Catholics, good old fashioned Catholic social thought. So, yes, I think we need a, a new skeptical eye um, if we didn't have one already when it comes to corporations and business um, when it comes to abortion. Christina, Charlie brings up a really good point around support for women. The former general counsel of the EEOC said these funding proposals on abortion travel might be pregnancy discrimination. How do you view that? Well, I can see that because if you think about it, what message is it sending to women? If you have two women that are working at a, a business, a corporation, and they're both pregnant and they're both scared, 
And one woman knows I can go to my boss and I can get an abortion that's paid for. And the other woman thinks I'm afraid to go to my boss because I don't even know if I'll be able to take off enough time to be with my baby if I have my baby. So that really leads the woman who's thinking about having her baby to perhaps lean towards abortion because abortion is something that's covered and maybe it's not covered for her to spend enough time at home with her child or get the support and resources that she needs. And so what's actually happening is companies and businesses are actually coercing women towards abortion. They're influencing them towards abortion by offering this financial incentive and not offering the support and the resources that they need to parent a child. J.D., I see you shaking your head. You get the last word on this. Yeah, I, I think that that's absolutely right. I mean, when the uh, the idea that, that the abortion rights, uh, people are, are more in favor of a woman getting a right to choose, that's simply not true. They, they, they are being coerced toward a particular decision. And uh, and if we really want to, even, even in these states where we, we face a very difficult uh, battle as pro-life individuals, like in California or New York, uh, I think that we need to start making the case of why uh, the women need to be given more support when they do choose life, when they do choose uh, the, the life of their baby, and that that we're, that we're there for them to, to to help make that choice. Because right now, it's true. Like there's a lot of pressure on women to have abortions, and that's bad for everyone. Well, thank you all for this in-depth conversation. I hope you'll join us again. Thank you. Thank you. They should have courage. It takes courage to be committed, and not only to speak. Uh, the good and the true, but actually to do the good and the true. It takes courage and prudence. The courage to fight for life. A leading Catholic theologian weighs in on total and incremental abortion bans in the political arena and the ballot box. As the pro-abortion agenda has progressed over the years, the Catholic Church has remained steadfastly pro-life. But when Catholics approach the ballot box, there isn't always a black and white option to protect life. I spoke with Father Thomas Petrie, the president of the Dominican House of Studies, about the nuances of incremental progress in the fight for life when casting a vote. Father Petrie, has the Church always advocated for a full ban of abortion, or has there been some nuance to that position? Well, the Church has always been steadfastly and absolutely pro-life and absolutely against abortion in any sense. Uh, this goes back, obviously, to Scripture. It goes back to the Didache, that early document on the teaching of the Apostles from the first, second century. Um, even in the Middle Ages, you know, I've heard Nancy Pelosi has said, you know, the Church didn't even know or doesn't know when the soul enters uh, the baby. Uh, Augustine didn't know this. Thomas Aquinas didn't know this. Yeah, there were arguments about that. But even then, nobody ever thought it was okay to interfere with the process of life and how life comes into existence, how God creates life. Um, so the church has always been absolute. Abortion is absolutely evil. Um, now, when it comes to the politics mm -hmm. and, and, and so-called bans, this is something that society's only had to deal with in the last 50, 60 years. And so the church is always going to ask for politicians to be prudent and to exercise prudence in limiting the evil of abortion, limiting all evil as much as possible, especially in a system like ours that's a Republican dem democracy. What is the nuance? Is political progress and incremental progress a f part of the fight? Or how do, we, how do we think about that? Well, St. John Paul II spoke about this in Evangelium Vitae, you know, the landmark encyclical on the gospel of life. And he, he noted that there can be real progress in what he would call limiting the evil of abortion so that you could have a piece of legislation that may not be an outright ban of abortion but might limit it say by limiting at what weeks an abortion mm -hmm. might be able to be chosen and had so we never want to make the good the enemy of the perfect right it is good to save as many lives as we can now as we look forward to saving all the lives that we can in the future and if we talk about the issue of compassion and the way that women feel right now they feel very much like they're on the defensive um, we we know that the church does not support the criminalization of abortion. It does not support putting women in jail um, who are effectively ending the lives of their children. Why is that? 
Well, because we understand that the choice for abortion is often a very difficult choice for most women, if not all women who choose it. Uh, oftentimes they're being pressured by boyfriends, husbands, families, um, morally pressured by employees, employers, by the culture. Uh, and so the choice is often not a free choice and it's not unmitigated. And so we, we, we approach um, abortion and women who have had abortion not as perpetrators of an evil, but as in fact victims of an industry and a culture of death. And in understanding that industry and that culture of death, why is the free will part of this for the church so important? Why, why is that concept something that's so important for us as Catholics? Well, because God has given us freedom, and as we, as we invoke our freedom and make choices, we become uh, part of the choices we make. Every choice we make impinges upon our character. Father Petrie, let's get specific. There are rumors that there will be a supposed 20-week ban on the Hill uh, at some point, and there are, there's a coalition that wants to support this. Would the church at some point come out and say that a 20-week ban at the federal level is a good thing? Well, the church would never comment directly on particular legislation. What we would say is that the church's teaching is that politicians have an obligation to mitigate evil as much as they can, even if they can't perfectly eliminate evil. And that we leave it to politicians to determine the prudence uh, and the optics for their own, you know, pursuit of these, this agenda of values, uh, but keeping always in mind that the good of limiting the scope of what Pope Francis calls the absolute evil of abortion. And we know that there are Democrats and Republicans and independents, an entire coalition that would be behind some kind of an incremental ban, uh, but the there are some politicians who align themselves with the church and say that they are doing the pro-life work of the church. There was an article by Ramesh Panuro in National Review Online who called them out saying you can't say that you're aligning yourself with the church and pro-life values and at the same time then say that the Dobbs decision that got rid of Roe leaves everything up to the states. You have to in some way pursue to this at the federal level. What can we say about that as Catholics? Well, I think, I think Ramesh is right. Uh, there's a personal responsibility of politicians, especially in our system in the United States on the federal level to take responsibility for this. Yes, at the state level, certainly, but also at the federal level. And so you can't simply wash your hands and say it's no longer an issue for Capitol Hill. Quite clearly it is. And pro-abortion advocates are going to keep it an issue on Capitol Hill and an issue at the White House. And so uh, those who are pro-life need to understand and find and strategize for ways to limit uh, the impact of such a radically pro-abortion agenda that will continue to uh, expand unless there's pushback against it. But that pushback needs to be successful, not necessarily perfect. Pope Francis has definitely allowed for the uh, ministering and pastoral accompaniment of politicians to be done by the bishops, which is appropriate. Um, but he has called out certain inconsistencies, that's the word that he mm -hmm. used, um, in advocating for abortion as public leaders. Is this something that the American church should be doing more about? Well, you know, far be it from me to tell the bishops how to do their jobs. <laughs> I know this is a very difficult position, and a lot of bishops disagree with each other on how to pastorally approach, say, politicians who are, in fact, Catholic and pro-abortion. Um, but clearly for the state of the church but and the state of their own souls, this is what pastoral accompaniment means, to pastorally accompany people out of their inconsistency and into communion and consistency with the church's teaching, which is to say, to bring them closer to Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. And to help them find courage. Absolutely. This is a moment where, that no one imagined, where we are being called to have courage and to speak the truth and to fight for life, especially with the midterms coming up. Is this a moment for the laity to do more and to say more, and what would that look like? Well, ordering the secular realm and orderly, ordering politics and the civil realm is in fact the vocation of the laity. You know, it's not the vocation of the bishop, it's not the vocation of the priest. And so all the more reason for the lay faithful to be informed, to get informed, and to do what they can to support their legislators, to support uh, those candidates who uh, espouse the values of truth and goodness and life, and to uh, elect them and to get them into office. Well, that's a beautiful call to action. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you, Monsi. 
Father Petrie recently wrote a commentary on abortion in the National Catholic Register, which is owned by EWTN. You can head to their website to read it, and we'll make sure to post it on our social media channels, too. The Week in Review is coming up after the break. Plus... At our Congress, you can see representatives of different religions who otherwise will not meet anywhere else. And here, they are at the same round table. Here, they will not only see each other, but also shake hands and talk. A major meeting for interreligious dialogue. We tour the Central Asian country of Kazakhstan, where Pope Francis will meet with world faith leaders to promote peace and understanding. Next. The death of Queen Elizabeth II tops our week in review. As we reported at the top of this program, the 96-year-old monarch passed away at Balmoral Castle in Scotland on Thursday. Leading for 70 years, she served the longest reign in the history of the British Commonwealth and is the longest reigning head of state in the world. Queen Elizabeth was known for her steadfast dedication to duty and remained a symbol of stability in an ever-changing world. The crown now passes to her oldest son, King Charles III. Abandoning Sunday Mass, a diocese in the Netherlands will no longer offer Mass every Sunday in its parishes. The Diocese of Roermond informed parishes, parishes in a letter of moving toward offering Mass only every other week, abandoning its previous rule of offering at least one Sunday service in every parish. Church leaders say the decision was made due to a shortage of priests and to save on energy costs. They also say that there aren't enough people participating in Mass, so it would be more motivating to bring believers from different parishes together. The Vatican unveiled a portrait last Sunday of John Paul I, who reigned as Pope for just 33 days during a beautiful beatification ceremony. A relic and a handwritten note by the blessed Pope on the theological virtues was also displayed. Often called the Smiling Pope, Known for his humility and teaching the faith in an approachable style, John Paul I died unexpectedly in 1978, one month after the conclave elected him. Pope Francis said that with a smile, Pope John Paul I managed to communicate the goodness of the Lord. Pope Francis is gearing up for his trip to Kazakhstan next week, where he will meet with religious leaders during the 7th Congress of Leaders of World and Traditional Religions. The objectives of this Congress, which first began in 2003, are to provide a permanent space for interreligious dialogue, strengthen mutual understanding, respect and tolerance among religious communities as a counterbalance to the ideology of hatred and extremism, and expand dialogue between different cultures and religions with the involvement of both religious and secular representatives. Pope Francis will also be meeting with Kazakhstan's minority Catholic community, providing a sign of solidarity with our brothers and sisters there. The diverse Central Asian country borders Russia, China, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan. It's predominantly Muslim. EWTN Rome producer Alexei Gotovsky is a native of Kazakhstan. He gives us a closer look at the small but dynamic Catholic community in his homeland. Welcome to Kazakhstan and right with us from the north part of Kazakhstan to the south in this EWT News In Depth report. Kazakhstan is an enormous country in the center of Asia. With stunning vast landscapes and a diverse kaleidoscope of people with different languages faiths and beliefs. And despite that fact that out of the country's nearly 19 million inhabitants, just 1% are Catholic, this is where Pope Francis has chosen to go on his next papal trip. In mid-September, leaders from the world's main religions will gather in Kazakhstan for a special conference on the role of the religion in a post-pandemic world.
but what the Catholic Church in Kazakhstan lacks in numbers, it makes up for in enthusiasm. And here in the north of the country, at the shrine of Our Lady Queen of Peace in the village of Azorne, the faith is very much alive. Father Marius is the rector of the shrine. He walks us by the lake which for the people here is the site of a miracle after the great famine of World War II. Here the people were praying through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary for help. And on March 25th, 1941, a miracle occurred. The temperature rose and the snow melted and filled this place near the village, forming a lake. The appearance of the lake may have been a cyclical phenomenon, but the miraculous thing was that the lake appeared with an abundance of fish. Now the village of Azorne has become the home of the only Marian shrine in the vast region of Asia, and an important beacon of light for the people here. On the other side of the village, Carmelite sister Elizabeth, together with four other sisters, live and pray. Together they pray for peace in the community they formed 15 years ago. You could say that we are sheltered with Jesus in the tabernacle. It gives us a chance to be close to the heart of Jesus, and together with him we pray for all peoples and each person. We pray for these people who suffer, but we must also offer a lot of prayers and sacrifices for the people who cause the suffering. The nuns say that even in times of darkness, God is always present, and this lake is an example of that. On the 100th anniversary of the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima, the miracle with the fish repeated. There were so many fish, it drew people here from different cities to go fishing. Sister Elizabeth says that recent repetition of the miracle reminds us that Our Lady dwells here in the land of Kazakhstan. The Pope will not be able to visit Azorne, but he is going to bless the shrine's new icon, Mother of the Great Steps, while he is in Nur Sultan, the capital of Kazakhstan. The capital lies on the banks of the Ishim River in the north of the country. Heavily influenced by Japanese architecture, the city has a bustling trade and industrial sector. The interreligious summit due to take place here in the city is being organized by the Nazarbayev Center. Bulat Sarsenbayev is the chairman of the center. In Kazakhstan, we have a population of over 100 ethnic groups and 18 official religious confessions that are registered, so it's a very important issue for us. It is a question of unity of the nation and a question of peaceful existence. Gulsana Tulebergenova is another one of the key people preparing for the summit. The main outcomes of the Congress will be outlined in the final declaration. And this declaration will be disseminated among uh, political and business leaders uh, to, and, and uh, will be sent to international organizations, including the UN. Local Catholics and residents are excited about Pope Francis' upcoming visit, which the Metropolitan Archbishop Tomasz Peta is calling historic. There is already a logo and there is a motive for the Pope's visit, a slogan that sounds, messengers of peace and unity. I think that's what it's all about. The highlight for the Catholics will be a celebration of the Holy Mass at the Expo Square. 40,000 people are expected to attend. 
And for those who can't get into the square, the mass will be shown live on large screens broadcasting from the city's skyscrapers. It is sure to be a monumentous occasion for the Catholic Church here, which emerged from the shadows of the Soviet Union only 30 years ago. In Kazakhstan, Alexey Gotovsky, EWTN News in depth. We will bring you complete coverage of the papal trip to Kazakhstan, its impact on Catholics there, as well as major moments of the Seventh Congress of Leaders of World and Traditional Religions next week. If you would like to meet the artist who created the image of Our Lady of the Steps, you can watch it on the EWTN YouTube channel and discover how his culture influenced his art. That does it for this week's episode of EWTN News In Depth. We hope you enjoyed our coverage. Tune in next week, same time, for more stories important to your Catholic life. See you then.